to lecture 14 in our innovation and commercialization class. And uh, in this lecture, we would like to now start to build upwards from the individual and individual innovation process and start heading into larger systems. You recall that for uh, our methodology here, we mentioned at the very beginning that other work on innovation always starts at a macro level where you can't really see the important, the key um, individual uh, uh, innovation process running inside a person's mind or a group's mind when they actually innovate. Because we've covered that now, now we can build upward and say, fine, now that we understand how innovation happens and what people have to do to innovate, the human process of innovating, now we can look at teams and organizations uh, meaning um, universities and companies. Uh, and so we'll, we'll build up in this lecture. Um, it'll be a fairly short lecture because now that we understand this, we'll just talk briefly about um, what this means for uh, in innovation teams and then also um, the implications for um, how organizations are being limited today on how they're organized for innovation, but how things might improve in the future. Welcome to the first part of the, the um, innovation lecture. <clears throat> In this lecture, we'd like to cover past problems associated with organizations. Now that we've made this, um, this, this model, it's fairly easy to see um, typical problems in corporations and universities. And then, you know, just, just using the model in that way, we then like to uh, move into uh, starting from the bottom up, start with uh, teams, innovators and teams, and then in the second part of this lecture, build up and talk about um, what corporations and universities can do to improve the... Uh... So first we'll do the problems graphically. So uh, typically uh, the way that we've evolved uh, at least, you know, in, in modern times, and this lecture is being uh, um, recorded in 2013, uh, we are, are in the situation where for probably a few decades, maybe a couple decades, uh, most universities, and again, there's exceptions in places that are very porous and have a lot of uh, corporate influence and uh, entrepreneurial influence and other kinds of outside influences. But in general, um, you know, here is our current model in the university where, you know, predominantly universities are funded to do some sort of abstract technical work. Again, we're kind of uh, doing this, uh, as we know, in our <clears throat> fundamental innovation language, we need more elements than this, but that's not what's done today. Uh, we predominantly look at, at uh, a scientific or technical problem and we choose it, as I said, most of the time, more or less randomly, or in an isolated community uh, that isn't so connected these days to application, they find what's, you know, quote unquote interesting, uh, which really means kind of what, what um, you know, funding can be raised for from the government, which is also not very connected because remember that, uh, as we'll talk about in the, in the next lecture series about the American innovation system, they lo no longer get good signaling from corporations who aren't investing long term anymore. So um, that's kind of how we got here in a brief nutshell, but uh, using our little diagram to show what's wrong with this, well, <clears throat> what happens now is the... Um, in the university, for whatever properties or metrics that we think are important, we work on the technology and, and whittle it down to, um, as one of my colleagues says, a very nice polished stone, although it might be the wrong stone. And uh, you can see why, you know, given our current knowledge in, in, in this class of the innovation process, why this may be uh, an issue because this is being narrowed with presumption about we know in isolation what the right properties are. Uh, to give you a more clear example, you know, I could be <clears throat> sticking with some 
idea that if we just could have, let's say it's a new material, I could get property X, Y, and Z, then I know that if, if, we can, if, if we can do research and indeed the research works out and I can narrow it down to that thing that I think will give X, Y, and Z, uh, the world will be knocking at our door. Uh, but it turns out, for a bunch of reasons as we know, let's say that there's other research going on, uh, you know, purple dots in other labs, uh, and uh, market and implementation are also changing during all this long-term research. Um, you know, it might be properties A, B, and C that are actually the most important ones, and we don't really realize it because we're not involved in any way in thinking about A, B, and C because we've been isolated in thinking only about technology and all of my colleagues that are, you know, essentially isolated from any uh, market and implementation, they also, um, you know, believe the same thing. And so here we are, and, and we've created this uh, wonderful, uh, you know, property, uh, this, this research, which actually looks successful because it's converged on X, Y, and Z. Now, remember, in principle, you know, the path not chosen, which you can't see here, I'm saying that, amazingly, that research would have led to a different embodiment where properties A, B, and C um, are enhanced. But nonetheless, now that we're very excited and, and the community recognizes in modern times and the community is, is void of any, you know, corporate or real market uh, information in general, uh, now we try to take that to, to market. And we've had all these great entrepreneurship programs which by the way, we're not around when many of the companies that we look at that gave long-term decade-wide growth, you know, those programs weren't around. And in fact, you know, a lot of those things happened, you know, kind of out here and not, not directly as a result from, from uh, the university. But what I'm showing you here is kind of, you know, nowadays with the longer, um, you know, long-term corporate investment not there, meaning, you know, there's not Bell Labs or, or IBM Labs uh, or HP Labs, the way they used to be, you know, investing out and having a tail overlap with universities. Uh, in general, all the burden has fallen to the university to be not only educating people, not only to be doing the leading edge research, but also building the nuclei that are needed for corporations that don't want to put any effort uh, and risk into long-term uh, innovation. So, you know, we've got all these programs that say, great, you know, this professor is very excited. They've whittled this down, you know, to this little nugget. And now we're going to uh, try to iterate. We're going to jump out. And now we are indeed going to look at the application that we thought it would be good for. And, you know, a particular kind of implementation that happens just because, you know, this might be a startup, for example. And so this is kind of the general linear, right? Remember, this is the linear process that we talked about. And so all these programs to kind of do this are better than nothing, but really what's going on is that, um, you know, Obviously, since they haven't influenced the shape of this until now, the chances of getting these to converge are low. And of course, there is no convergence. And when I draw three circles like this, I mean, there's basically no innovation by our definition, meaning that the idea does not uh, reach the, the marketplace. So um, now, um, what is the answer to that? Well, the answer is that if we take a much wider view of things and say, hey, we really don't know all the different business models or companies that could be interested, and then, you know, there's actually quite a wide uh, application space when we're back at this stage, when, when we're still moving along at an earlier stage, you'd want this information to, to kind of come in so that we could iterate. And there's no programs that actually do that. <clears throat> the program assumes that the universities are perfect. Uh, they know what can happen. They must do this. And then at this interface to the outside world, there's a one-way street. And of course, this is kind of crazy based on what we know in this class now. Uh, there's very 
few programs trying to um, affect the way that the problem choice occurs. And that is the key to getting a higher yield and a vibrant um, innovation ecosystem in the current in current environment. So that is um, one problem and we can identify that now with our little model. Now we talked quite a bit about um, you know in the first intro lecture and we'll talk more about this later we talked about uh, basic corporate labs and I just mentioned in the previous slide that Universities, as I just said, have been given all the burden to do everything, basically, and put it on a silver platter for corporations. But before, <coughs> uh, universities, uh, corporations used to invest long term. We had AT&T, Bell Labs, IBM, HP, TI, you know, all these laboratories. Uh, we'll talk about later why that was. But <coughs> um, many, many great things came from those laboratories. Great... Um, fundamental innovations, and the classic thing was that they were never able to bring them to market. And so, um, you know, can we use our model to describe why that system uh, was, was, was good at the beginning, but not um, in the end? And so that's what we're doing here. So in that case, and again, just like before, time is moving on this axis, and, and then there's sort of outside world, which if I wasn't clear on last view graph, that's what I was talking about. So, um, you know, these barriers are kind of organizational barriers. And so Bell Laboratories was somewhat isolated from AT&T, but not 100%. In fact, the great thing is that uh, market and implementation knowledge came across and did affect Bell Laboratories quite a bit, which is why in this diagram I have implementation and market being present at the early fundamental research stage where they were not present in the uh, university case. So now you can see the huge advantage of those laboratories, uh, especially since you know, most of those companies were market dominant. And so they actually had quite a wide array of potential market applications. So for example, uh, in Bell Laboratories, they uh, researched everything from, let's say, you know, transistors up to, you know, telecom systems. So really, talk about a range of applications, uh, it wasn't as wide as the outside world, but at least in this time period, in this innovation paradigm that was starting, the, um, you know, that's a, that's a lot of market application windows in here. So a lot of different applications, which allows you to work on the right fundamental technology pieces at the beginning which allows you to go through this process internally, uh, actually, and converge on uh, very fundamental innovations. Now, the implementation piece, as I mentioned previously, you know, in the strain silicon example, um, it's all in these days, and it'll become a problem later. It was assumed, and it's hard to imagine today because, you know, we think much more, uh, we're much more nimble about thinking about how these things get to market, even though, you know, part of this class is to try to get um, a wider group of people early in their education thinking about these things. But, um, you know, back then, companies uh, use their current, you know, sort of, I would call them internal education. Uh, models, you know, business models, uh, you know, they did their own manufacturing, you know, outsourcing at this time was extremely rare. Even joint ventures were kind of like, ah, you know, not sure if we should really do that. So you got to picture a world where when a fundamental innovation occurred, it was always assumed that the, the current 
implementation, you know, you would build that all inside the company, vertically integrated, right? So from soup to nuts, you know, we do the research and do all the manufacturing and we sell it into the marketplace. Any real company would do that back then. So huge advance is that, you know, in, in this time period then, uh, whoops, let me go back. A huge advance is that um, great at getting down to um, going from fundamental to uh, you know um, something that now is starting to 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 reach mid stage. And you know what's amazing about Bell Labs, and I noticed it when I was there, was that if you look at the history. It was sort of like so many things that Bell Labs did um, ended up, once they got to this mid-stage, they stopped. And then you would see other companies five, ten years later take advantage of those advances and bring them to market. And you know, another classic example of this was Xerox Labs. Remember, that's the famous one where uh, Xerox had developed... Uh, along with, you know, other research air in the area, um, uh, Stanford Research Institute, for example, did early work on the mouse, and uh, then Xerox really became a leader in research in looking at the future of computing. Of course, Ethernet came from there, same kind of thing, in, in order to have its full implication. Uh, Bob Metcalf from 3Com, which really then... Uh, after, you know, completed this exercise because they couldn't do it internally. Another example uh, was the, the mouse and the graphical user interface, which was taken by, uh, famously by Steve Jobs and then uh, used in Apple to create the Macintosh. So uh, these are all examples where things would go uh, from fundamental mid -stage. Remember, this is the hard part. You know, people are really trying, hey, where's that fundamental idea that, you know, they want universities to do this now course, as I said, universities lack what these companies had, which is broad market applications because they owned their market pretty much. And uh, they um, had manufacturing and people that inside the company that could talk to you about, you know, how they make things. And so, um, you know, universities cannot replicate this in, in most areas um, because they don't have, you know, of course, the, the same kind of, of implementation market information that these companies had. So you get to the mid-stage, but the question is, well, why then uh, do these things, why were they so good at fundamental innovation and then losing it at mid-stage? And, you know, the answer is that what happened was you would get to this mid-stage, but remember, it was assumed that, okay, uh, for example, we'll take the strain silicon example. We're going to manufacture this. Uh, in Allentown, you know, at and it, it wasn't like we're going to license this to everyone else. Um, I mean, at and did do that uh, for a variety of things, but from a different mechanism, like sort of like, oh, we're all these big companies, we're going to cross-license, but not in a business model sense where, you know, a, a, a company like we did would jump out there and actually look at various different means, intellectual property being only one of them. It was assumed that, of course, you know, so we actually did take trips to Allentown, whatever, trying to figure out how the heck we would ever manufacture strain silicon internally, and that, that's one of the reasons why um, I had to leave in order to pursue that uh, technology further. Uh, the other thing is the market applications, you know, uh, if you look at, uh, let's say even then, we look at ICs outside outside uh, of AT&T's market. Remember, these are AT&T ICs. And what happens if I needed to have, um, like in this case, microprocessor? AT&T was not big in microprocessor. It was the first product that adopted strain silicon. So um, you can't converge. So you start to realize that's the organization that is limiting uh, the innovation process. And so just like the university case, um, the uh, convergence was not done. Now, I mentioned several times through these lectures 
But of course, what happened in this phase is that eventually uh, all these companies producing sort of these seedlings, you know, it created an opportunity for startups to actually take things from this stage to here. But we should remember, and I'll talk about this in the next set of lectures, Lectures 15, American Innovation System, this is not a, a repeatable process because as, they, as these guys don't make, uh, um, they don't see if they're bean counting in the short term, they don't see huge yield from this process. So they're going to shut this down. But these guys, remember, are inherently financially successful because they're taking things that were invested previously all this time and they're bringing them to the marketplace. And so it's a huge yield, but these guys can't come back and do this kind of fundamental innovation research. Their market, first of all, is, their market knowledge is very small. But second is that, uh, in that particular thing, if they're successful in the first time, but second is that they're, um, uh, you know, the resources necessary to invest aren't there for them. So, of course, that's why, like I said in the previous slide, you know, this whole process has somehow fallen onto the shoulders of universities. <laughs>